yeah we're that's yeah. us ready to go so just before you start shannon just for anyone that missed this morning's rundown um this is shannon Ivan. she's a chartered educational and behavioral psychologist and she's nearly three decades in supporting uh, children and youth experiencing learning and behavioural difficulties. She's also the co-founder of Reach Children's Services in Westmead. And in more recent years, Shannon has undertaken specialist training in acceptance and commitment therapy and has expanded her scope to encompass mental health issues in youth. Um, her role within Reach Services stretches from everything from diagnostic assessment, educational assessments, autism assessments, to up to behavioural and mental health support. Um, with a blend of personal, lived and professional insights into neurodivergent, Shannon is a great advocate for empowering and um, for empowering and advocating the thriving futures of neurodivergent children and youth. So today, Shannon's going to take us through exploring social competence through a neuroaffirmative lens which is a very um, important and um, topical conversation at the moment considering that uh, social skills are an area of uh, teaching and learning and many from many different professions um, but in, in light of uh, the differences in neuro in, in neurotype Mm -hmm. uh, social competence uh, has a different has a different swing on it. So I let Shannon explain it because she can do it so much better than me. We'll see. We'll see. Um, yeah, I suppose social skills programs have become a, a little more controversial these days. So uh, thanks, everybody. Yeah, first I just want to say thanks so much to ISPA for the invitation to present today. Um, and of course, uh, applaud them for an incredibly informative community day. And thanks to all of you for joining me on this talk, um, especially those of you that have been in front of a, a laptop all day. I know that can be tough. Um, I want to start off today by acknowledging that not everyone may feel that they relate to this, and that's OK. And um, those of you with or supporting very young children may or may not see the relevance just yet. And uh, there may be parents, carers, and educators who feel that their concerns are greater or different than those discussed here. And I think that can be true and this still be really important. And um, because even if or where that's the case, I'd suggest there's a greater good here. And um, today's conversation I think it'll be a bit different than uh, some of the earlier ones. It's it's not so much about strategies and intervention. It's about the messages that we send to youth, whether that be our students, the neighbors' kids, our children, or their friends. Uh, it's about our community relationships and and children's well-being. Actually, I had a a post-assessment consultation with a family. Um, after diagnosing their three-year-old last week. And the parent asked what to expect for their child's future in terms of well-being and mental health. And while we know that the research suggests that autistic youth and adults experience much higher rates of anxiety and mood disorders, I think young children diagnosed present day, at least I definitely hope, um, that they, they may fare far better. Um, they will if, if we can change our views and begin to create more supportive and inclusive environments. So I hope today's um, conversation um, and, and the various presentations today um, will further those conversations along. So sorry, that's just reflecting my journey. Um, I, I have little interest in spending much time talking about me, um, my background, but I do think it might be helpful to have some context. It's been a long and windy journey for me. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, as, as Laura said, started my career about 30 years ago. It was in a very clinical research-driven ABA setting. Um, most of the youth that I worked with were those that might be described as non or minimally speaking. Um, often with co-occurring intellectual disabilities. Um, 
all all of them displayed behaviors. It, it was actually a residential um, unit, or I should say an inpatient um, unit. So all displayed behaviors that put themselves or others at risk of significant harm or social exclusion. Um, so many were at risk of losing school placements or being placed you know, out of the home into to residential, um, residential placements. So I have that perspective. And since those early years, I've had a, a, a range of very different experiences and my practices have really evolved through additional training and mentoring and life experience and a bit of self-discovery and personal reflection. Um, so just to say my entire household, um, everyone in my immediate house is neurodivergent of some flavor, um, some multiply neurodivergent. And mine was only discovered after exploring my own anxiety with a, a psychologist um, years ago. In recent years, I've been practicing as an educational and behavioral psychologist, completing diagnostic assessments, as well as providing therapeutic supports for children and youth experiencing significant mental health difficulties. So I kind of have a, a range of different um, perspectives to, and, and experiences to draw upon. And I have to admit that it actually took me uh, quite some time to understand and really invest in the concepts or the, the ideas that I'll be talking about today. Um, I didn't start here, but, uh, oh, and, and I should add that, you know, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still learning and practice is still evolving. And I'm not here talking about this because I'm an expert. Um, I'm just here because I think it's really important. And look, I may be a bit further along on this journey than some, um, but I'm sure I'm, I'm behind others. So what I want to start with is, um, I suppose, a, an introduction to the concept of neurodivergence. Uh, actually, I am, I don't know if, if um, whoever's there in tech support, I was curious about sending through a, a poll um, to everybody, and I'm, I'm not going to review it. Maybe we'll review it at the end, but I'm just curious how many people are uh, familiar with neurodivergence, um, have, have never heard from it, or never heard of it, uh, maybe somewhat familiar, and how many people are very, very familiar. Um, but I, I think it is, it's important to, to start that conversation here. You, you may have noticed the term neuroaffirmative in the title, um, and of course you just heard me refer to my own family as <clears throat> neurodivergent. Um, and I think it's important to understand the difference between thinking of conditions like autism, ADHD, and other learning and behavior differences as a neurodivergence versus a pathology. And as I said, I, this may be very familiar to some of you. Um, I don't imagine it's you know familiar to everyone. So I just really think we need to be kind of all on a, an even ground here, because um, as I said, it, it's kind of is the, the root, root of it. Thanks for, for launching that poll. Um, so the, the traditional way of thinking about these differences has been to pathologize them and the individual. So within a pathology paradigm, it is considered that there is only one right or healthy brain and that each and every one of us should aspire to achieve that. And the thought is that those who don't have or can't achieve this are wrong or broken. And so the aim of therapies or supports would have always been to move towards normal or um, what's referred to as normalization. And these are folks that talk about cures and recovery. And this is often referred to as the medical model. Neurodiversity, on the other hand, refers to the idea that we all experience the world through a different lens because no two brains are the same. There is no normal or right style of human mind any more than there is one normal or right ethnicity, gender, or culture. It assumes diversity is a natural part of humanity, and this celebrates and appreciates difference. Um, Credit for first using the term 
neurodiversity has been given to an Australian sociologist, uh, Judy Singer, in the late 1990s, who suggested that just as biodiversity is crucial for life on Earth, neurodiversity is equally crucial for the well-being and progress of humanity. Where the pathology paradigm focused on treatment and recovery, the neurodiversity paradigm has led to models of disability that focus more on environmental and uh, societal accommodations. We'll come back to the implications on mental health in a bit, uh, but I don't think it's difficult to imagine how these two different ideas might impact a youth, how, how the youth views themselves, um, and as well as you know how they are reviewed by by others. So I will quickly will address the elephant in the room. Um, ABA has been viewed by many to be in direct opposition to the the neurodiver neurodivergence movement. Um, I debated with myself on whether to address this today, whether this was really kind of the best forum to discuss this. Um, but I think we need to be having these conversations out in the open if we want to improve how we support individuals and if we're to build strong relationships with the community. And I know ISPA is supportive of, of this as well. Um, these conversations are, are really important. So many in the autistic community have been very critical, um, suggesting that ABA practices have caused harm. And that dates back to practices that have evol involved um, punishment, threats, coercion, and interventions and strategies to change behaviors that really probably didn't uh, improve the lives of individuals but maybe instead made it easier for others to understand them or to, to be around them. And I can't say, honestly, all of those practices have been abolished everywhere, um, but there certainly has, there have been changes and in, in continued movement in um, a more positive direction, a more, more helpful direction, I'll say. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've been in the field, as I said, kind of a long time, and I, I can honestly say that I'm a little bit mortified when I think about some of the stuff I was doing really early on. Uh, but ABA is, is built on a science that is ever evolving. Uh, our practices evolve with new information. And I'm hoping, again, that, you know, everything today uh, really reflects that. Um, and actually, just, just to acknowledge, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not the first today to acknowledge some of the concerns about practices that have been promoted as ABA. And um, you, you heard others acknowledge that one of the most critical dimensions or components of ABA is the importance on social significance, and that we need to be certain that any behavior selected for behavior change is done so on the basis that it's going to impact that child, youth, or individual's quality of life in a positive way. Um, can ABA be, oh, I was going to say, compatible with, with neurodiversity? I, I would think so, and I, I hope so. But um, yeah, I, I do feel as a behavioral community, we need to, to work hard at it. So. So moving on, um, language is a really important feature of the neurodiversity movement. So I wanted to also take a few moments to summarize some of the terms and conditions. And now I'll admit that the term condition actually would be more closely aligned with the medical model, but I, I thought it was clever and I seldom pull off clever. So hopefully no one will fault me for that. I stuck with it. Um, We've already discussed neurodiversity, so I'll leave it at that. And the term neurodivergent is used to refer to a person whose brain differs from what is known to be the majority. Neurotypical, on the other hand, would refer to those who perceive and experience the world according to the majority or the norm. So when we say that something is neuroaffirmative, 
we are saying that um, the strategy or language recognizes and appreciates the full range of difference. So it doesn't favor one way over, or one way of being over another. Um, you've probably noticed that I'm consistently using the term autistic rather than child with autism. Um, and I think I've heard that throughout today, so yay. Um, the, the majority in the autistic community will say that they prefer identity first language. And maybe if we have time, I might um, comment a bit more on that later, but there's it, the, that's the, not the most important thing today. Um, I do, however, also want to say that it's important to respect or individual differences because there, you know, there certainly still are individuals out there that prefer, you know, individuals with, with autism. So I, again, um, that should be the individual's choice. Um, the next, actually I might be going on. So then you've got ADHD -er is uh, essentially the, the identity first alternative to person with ADHD. And ADHD would be an individual who identifies with both the autistic and ADHD neurotype. Um, Allistic, I just sort of, yeah, I don't tend to use that much. I, you probably won't hear it more um, in this presentation, but if you ever do hear it, allistic would be non-autistic. Um, anyone just just that anyone who is not autistic so someone could be neurodivergent and holistic um so for example an adhd -er. uh, and then there is ableism refers to the assumption that to be able-bodied or typical is superior and what everyone should aspire to so we're trying to move away from this medical model and ableist views and um, the whole idea of fixing people and moving toward more neuroaffirmative practices. So now uh, that we've spent some time talking about how we view autism, I wanna talk, kind of move more towards that, that social competence piece. And this is a good time to talk about, or um, just, yeah, introduce if you're not familiar, with the, the double empathy problem and its, its relevance to this conversation. So based on the pathology paradigm, the pre uh, predominant view of autism over the years has been that autistic individuals lack social skills. They have impairments in their abilities to communicate and relate to others, lack the ability to read social, social cues, um, infer the intentions, and internal states of others and lack empathy. The double empathy problem suggests that difficulties in relating or empathizing are not resulting from a lack of skills or empathy among autistics, but rather in differences, excuse me, in how the neurotypes relate. It suggests that there's a two-way disconnect due to differences in experiences, resulting in a mismatch in styles. We know that neurotypical individuals are deemed socially skilled, but have just as much difficulty interpreting autistic communication and understanding their um, the internal states of autistics. Again, one might argue, I suppose that's because the autistics aren't good at communicating or sending out the right signals, but if it is actually a skills deficit, associated with autism, surely those difficulties would exist within, within the group. In other words, autistics would not be able to effectively um, relate or communicate with other autistics. There is a, a growing interest in body of research in this area, um, and there was a really interesting study a few years ago that looked at this specifically with regard to effectiveness of communication. Um, so I just wanted to, to share that study real quick. Uh, researchers used a diffusion chain to determine whether there were differences in effectiveness of communication in a group of non-autistic adults, so all non-autistic adults, a group of 
all autistic adults, and then mixed. So if you think in terms of kind of the, the telephone game where there's a line of people and a word or phrase is whispered from one person to the next, that's kind of what they did. Um, in this instance, the researcher read a story to the first participant. Um, it was just those two in the room, read a story to the first participant, left the room, and the next participant came in, the first participant relayed the story to the second, the first participant left the room, and so on. You get you get the idea, I think. Um, and it continued until it made it through way right through um, eight people. And both the autistic groups and non-autistic groups were able to recall significantly more details uh, than the mixed group. They concluded that there was no significant difference in how effectively the autistic or the non-autistic groups transferred information, while the mixed group shared less information through the diffusion chain. So if it's not a skills deficit, but rather a difference, what does that mean for autistic youth? and the idea of, say, social skills instruction? Good question, I think. Um, you may have noticed that the, the title of this presentation um, referenced social competence um, rather than social skills, and, and that was very deliberate. So for the purpose of this conversation, I'm less concerned about specific social skills and what they look like. I'm more concerned with how they work or function. And for my uh, behavior analyst friends out there, of course, I'm, I'm talking about function over form or topography. Um, and, and why social competence? And social competence is generally regarded as the effectiveness to navigate social situations or the ability to handle social, uh, social interactions effectively. And um, when you dive into the research and the literature, it's there's obviously a kind of a, a lot more to it, and and the, those definitions leave a lot to uh, a lot for interpretation, a lot to be operationalized. Um, but on the surface, it's it's really as simple as that: effectiveness in social situations. So then, if we know that there are different communication styles and preferences among autistic and non-autistic groups, different behaviors or skills are likely to be more or less effective depending on the communication partner or who the youth is interacting with. Um, interestingly, the same behaviors might function or work differently in different contexts. Um, again, important, but um, not surprising because that's precisely how we as behavior analysts are inclined to think. So, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not going to argue that there's no value in uh, helping youth, autistic or not, to build skills to support social competence. Um, I'm not saying that we should abandon all social skills programs, if you want to put it that way. Um, I never speak in absolutes except just now, of course. Uh, this talk is just meant to broaden awareness as to when, why, and roughly how we might approach the situation. Um, and recognize that most social skills programs to date have involved teaching autistic or neurodivergent youth um, skills that are based on neurotypical norms and communicating whether deliberately or not, that there's only one right way and that they're doing it wrong. Um, and these programs or this line of thinking has led to social camouflaging or autistic masking. Social camouflaging refers to strategies used to blend into our social surroundings or present ourselves as different from who we are. It's typically a strategy used by autistic, um, by the autistic community in general to, to appear less autistic in social situations. For example, uh, indiv individuals may use learned phrases, work 
hard to make eye contact, constantly monitor and mimic social behaviors, learn social scripts and imitate facial expressions. Many people have argued that neurotypicals mask as well and suggest that it's just a part of life. And it may be true that most everyone will, to some degree, adjust their behavior and conceal certain aspects of themselves in certain situations. Um, look, we've all done, you know, whether it be at work or with in-laws, but the drain and the impact on neurodivergence and um, autistic individuals would be far more extensive. If you think about it, the need or energy involved in camouflaging is going to be proportionate to the extent to which your behaviors deviate from what would be expected. So basically, the, the more different you are, the harder you have to work, the more you have to think about it. And then when you also factor in possible differences in sensory processing, the process is absolutely uh, exhausting. And, and again, there's, there's now plenty of evidence that it takes a massive toll on an individual's mental health. <clears throat> Many studies have now proven that social or autistic camouflaging has been associated with increased rates of anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. So given this toll, I'd wonder if it would be fair to say that masking is probably a much more helpful or adaptive behavior for the neurotypical community than it is for the ND community. <clears throat> um, this quote has been featured. So, so Brene Brown is a, a social worker, I believe, by um, discipline, if you want to put it that way. Um, but she she's an author. She's, um, I mean, there, there are plenty of, of TED Talks. Um, anyway, I, I can't even, I don't know who I'd credit. This has been featured in so many presentations that I, I wouldn't even know who to pay finder's fee to. But I like it. So um, fitting in is one of the greatest barriers to belonging. Fitting in is about assessing a situation and becoming who you need to be in order to be accepted. Belonging, on the other hand, doesn't require us to change who we are. It requires us to be who we are. And I think um, everyone, everyone, irrespective of age, gender, culture, whatever, um, should have uh, a sense of belonging. Okay, I thought it might be helpful to have a look at some of the differences between autistic and non-autistic communication and interaction styles and preferences. Um, this won't cover everything, and obviously it's important to not make over overgeneralizations. But again, this is about sharing insight and creating awareness. And apologies if this is common knowledge to you, but even if so, I hope that the, the language I use will serve as a model or just even additional exposures, and maybe for some of you, and some multiple exemplar training on how we can discuss these behaviors as, as differences. And I hope you don't mind, but I'll be sprinkling um, some personal examples in as I go along with full and informed consent from my family. I should say largely my my son, um, but he was he was very eager to allow me to share. So one commonly recognized set of differences is with regard to conversational style. Generally speaking, neurotypicals are comfortable enough making small talk, and there's generally a good bit of to and fro, while autistic individuals are much more comfortable engaging in conversation with a purpose. Conversation tends to be more fact or interest-based. Um, you'll often find that autistic youth show a great enthusiasm or passion for horse riding or anime or could be anything. Um, and they enjoy sharing extensive details about that one topic and they, they prefer to focus on that one topic and might have difficulty switching. Um, and if you're not familiar, this is often referred to as info dumping. Um, 
often the autistic individual is said to be lacking in social skills or at fault or not recognizing can, maybe the cues that someone is bored but that places the, the the responsibility solely on the autistic individual whereas look you know one could just as easily argue that the neurotypical youth is having difficulty expressing um, themselves clearly or directly i'd say these conversations are far more com this conversation <laughs> is, is far more complicated than that um because i ultimately conversation is two-way and, and i'm sure you know there, there needs to be kind of a meeting in the middle but i am just trying to broaden our awareness to to both perspectives um communication style is another area of difference generally speaking autistic individuals will be most comfortable with direct clear and concise information which wouldn't always be the NT way. Um, so neurotypicals are far more likely to use sarcasm, idioms, or more indirect messages, um, requiring the autistic individual to make inferences or connections. So this is actually one difference that is very evident in my household. Um, my even particularly between my husband and I, um, and we we kind of laugh laugh a lot about it. Uh, I, I actually had a lot of difficulty deciding kind of what example or anecdote to show here, and um, something from home, or even you know because there'd be plenty from work as well. But I'm going to share a quick example from home, and then maybe a just a brief reflection. Um, as well that might offer an additional perspective my my oldest son is 18 audi hd and absolutely amazing um he, he's a mainstream youth high achiever and i bring that up only because it's important to realize that the the following examples i'm sharing are are not related to problem solving or cognitive ability um it's really down to, to communication style. Um, I remember ringing him one day on the way home from work and asking him to put chicken in the oven for dinner. His response was, do you want me to turn the oven on? And I did indeed. I, I told him yes. And I remember, though, having a moment of reflection um, at that moment. And... To be honest, I don't remember much of my own childhood. I, I, yeah, much at all of my own childhood. And and that's actually a, a part of my whole package of ND. Um, but I do remember hearing an awful lot, Shannon, for someone who is so smart, how can you lack common sense? I say my mom, you know, didn't intend on making me feel bad, uh, but messaging is really important. And conveying to a child through words or actions that they might lack cop on or are being a smart ass as, as we might say in the US, US and you know that kind of thing has an impact. So use and understanding of nonverbals would be another area of difference. This is one where the differences might be less obvious but actually still quite impactful. For example, those who are assessing, um, I suppose, less obvious presentations or kind of subtle presentations of autism, particularly in females, are finding that there may not be recognizable differences um, here in particular, but not because these behaviors are intuitive, but because the behaviors are learned or rehearsed. So, I'm going to share another story from home, and again, you know, with with full consent. Um, so it wasn't all that long ago that we were talking about one of the boys at school, uh, and my son Vaughn said, "But I don't think he likes me as much as I like him." So I, of course, asked why, and Vaughn suggested because he doesn't smile or look happy when we're hanging out. So I said to him that not everyone shows their happiness or their emotion through facial expressions. And he asked me, 
Um, because we do, we, we we talk about autism a lot and neurodivergence. But anyway, he he asked me, so is that common in autism? And I said that it is one of the the differences that we often look at um, when we are assessing. And he said, huh, that I I often feign expressions, and sometimes I forget, and it might be an issue. And I, I asked him to tell me more about that. And he reminded me uh, about the time we bought him, it was maybe two years ago, um, Panic at the Disco tickets for Christmas. And apparently he forgot to put on his excited face. <clears throat> I, I do recall asking him, um, was he not excited? Be because just that, you know, I, I knew Panic at the Disco was, was one of his favorite bands. And yeah, he just seemed kind of indifferent when he, when he opened the gift and just that, you know, I was like, oh, what, what's going on? Um, but yeah, so he just forgot to turn it on. And I found it really interesting that even though I know autism, um, my son's, he, so he's, you know, 18 and I'm still learning about his, because this was, this was probably just a few weeks ago, um, still learning about his internal experience. So, um, and I do appreciate that he is so, um, yeah, generous with his uh, his insights and, and and me sharing those. Um, okay, so back perhaps back to some of the more noticeable differences. Um, some autistic individuals may present as more formal or may use really sophisticated language with peers, which may not be perceived well or autistic individuals might use social scripts or their language might seem repetitive. Um, echolalia would also fall in this category. Um, now, of course, there may be instances where language and communication interventions may be helpful because a child is genuinely struggling to effectively communicate their preferences, needs, and emotions. And again, remember, we, you know, I'm, I'm not at all saying that um, we're abandon, abandoning any form of, of intervention or support, education or therapy. Uh, but the point is when and where we are, I'm, I'm kind of saying this over and over again, I think, um, it's because there is a direct benefit to the child. It will improve their quality of life. So again, we're back to um, social validity. And one final note about differences, um, differences on stimming. Again, I say you probably, many of you are familiar with this term, but stimming is the term used to describe repetitive or stereotypic behaviors. Common autistic stims might include rocking, flapping, spinning, or making noises. Uh, these behaviors can occur for many reasons. Sometimes they're expressions of joy. Sometimes they occur during periods of anxiety or sensory, um, sensory overload to help regulate. Whatever the reason, when they, um, they, they do serve a very important function for individuals. And this has been, I suppose, one of the, the biggest sources, one of, one, uh, of, of frustration expressed by um, the autism community with with ABA. So that being the, the emphasis, on, emphasis on reducing or um, kind of re replacing stims. There are indeed certain stims that can be harmful or destructive. I mean, obviously, if a child is engaging in or, or anyone is engaging in self-injurious behaviors such as Head banging or um, self biting, it, it might be serving, um, you know, it might be serving a regulatory function for them. But but you know, it's, it, there's also the, that risk of harm. So so that is important to acknowledge. But I'd say the days of targeting stims for the sake of social inclusion are being replaced with awareness and acceptance. Um, at least movement in that direction. And just one last comment there. There's also evidence to suggest that many neurotypical individuals engage in repetitive behaviors 
for similar reasons. Um, however, they tend to be less intense or obvious. Um, it might, might be behaviors such as twirling hair or bouncing the leg. I, I'm actually wondering how many people are noticing that I'm actually subtly rocking and spinning kind of back and forth in my chair. Um, yeah, yeah. Given my, my anxiety, I suppose that's serving a, a function for me. Um, okay, so how do we do better? As I've said here, the first step, I think, is adopting a view that appreciates and embraces, embraces differences. That sends a very different message than you're not good enough um, or not good enough until you can pass as, as NT. And again, messages are very important and we need to be engaging with youth and families as well. But the youth, yeah, the, the youth really need to be at the center of this. Um, and, and again, I think that's been a theme all day, which, which I've loved. Uh, we need to know what is important to them. So we need to be asking, uh, observing, and listening. And I have, you know, apologies, I've, I've talked a lot about, about my son today. Um, it, we are very fortunate that he's a really, really happy, confident guy. Um, super, super happy, super confident. And he really ha always has been. And while he's always had friends, I've also always noticed that he's, looked a bit lost in some or, or, or left out in, in some um, social situations. Rather than tell him to get out there, go play and, you know, launch into, you know, giving him scripts or teaching him how to join. My goal was always to check in with him to establish whether it was by choice or because he didn't know what to say or, you know, was, was too anxious. And when asked consistently, um, you know, when, when he was on the periphery, like it always seemed to be by his choice. I mean, you know, that's what he said. But I suppose I wasn't really listening um, enough. About a year ago, I picked him up from youth orchestra and asked him what he did for lunch, who, who he had lunch with and, he told me that he, he just sat there on his phone with his sandwich. And I think I must have said something to the effect of, would you not want to go to McDonald's with the others? Because I knew that that's what they did as a group. You know, they, they walked down to McDonald's. And he said, Mom, you're the only one that this bothers. So I was clearly still buying into, you know, kind of the, the NT norms that, you must be lonely if you're not part of the group. So I don't ask him anymore. Um, so what do, excuse me, what do I hope you take away from today's conversation? Well, I suppose first, as social competence refers to an individual's effectiveness in social situations, social competence is dependent on the context or the situation and the communication partners. As such, it's completely understandable uh, why neurodivergent youth and autistic youth feel much more at ease when interacting with other ND youth. I'm gonna be very straight here and admit that once upon a time, I would have been one to encourage parents, um, your first thing, first thing to do is have, have their children integrated with neurotypical peers who are strong language models and strong social skill models. And again, look, I'm not saying there's not value in that. Um, but I, you know, I very much, kind of one of the first things I say now is, you know, encourage families to increase their child's opportunities to engage with neurodivergent youth. And if there are parents listening here today, um, Similarly, I, I'd say in most cases, one, one of the most supportive things you can do for your child is to connect them with their community and create, um, create a sense of belonging. Let them find their place. We know from the research, one of the biggest pre 
protective uh, factors against stress and mental health difficulties. Um, it, it, it's social connectedness, yeah. So having a place to belong is, is crucial. Um, in considering whether there needs to be some some kind of intervention or or support to build social skills, relationship skills, or I suppose whatever whatever you want to call them, we need to consider first and foremost why, and are we doing so for ourselves or others, or are we doing so because the skills or behaviors will genuinely help the youth achieve goals or have experiences that are meaningful for them. So again, for, for the behavior analysts out there, are we selecting behaviors for change uh, that will help them access natural communities of reinforcement, always keeping in mind that reinforcers are individually determined? And I would like to suggest that a neuroaffirmative approach to social skills um, would involve increasing youth's awareness to communication and interaction differences so that they are better equipped to understand when um, when or where, I suppose, communication breakdowns occur, but that it's not prescriptive about conforming to any specific expectations. Uh, I would also suggest that intervention support them in recognizing for themselves when and where it may be helpful to adjust their interaction style. I realize that may sound as if I'm advocating for masking, and that's not necessarily uh, not necessarily what I'm trying to say. Although, again, there may be times when masking would be helpful. Um, it, it's not for me to judge. That 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 all relates to to the youth's preferences and values, it, it, it's up to them. Um, there are certainly some folks that are championing some of these practices, just to say. Um, I really, really like some of the, the stuff that Mission Cognition do over in the States. Um, all age ranges, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you can check those out. And then locally, I, I know Jolene had mentioned earlier that um, we've been working with Dr. Sarah Cassidy uh, on her ACT and values-based mental health program. Um, there are four modules. One is emotion regulation. One of them is uh, actually social skills. So we've been doing some of this. She's been doing some of that. Um, I think they're in their fourth year of running it in data collection. And actually, she'll be talking a lot about that at DBA this this year, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow. So there's some really, there is some really, really good stuff happening um, in this area locally. And uh, I think a lot of people are implementing, it's, it's actually been quite some time since I've looked at the peers curriculum, um, but I think some folks are presenting that in really um, neuroaffirmative ways as well. Um, yeah, so anyway, there, there you go. Um, I just want to real quick mention that uh, I, I'm excited to announce that for our fifth birthday, Reach reaches five years, five years old this this month. Um, and as part of um, Autism Acceptance Month, we are going to launch, sorry, this is new, Laura, I just stuck this in here. And um, we're gonna launch Reach Out and Connect, Embracing Neurodivergence. So we're putting together um, just a little workshop for youth uh, right now, aged eight to twelve, um, just come together. It's it, it's going to be kind of an hour and a half of just kind of exploring neurodivergence and celebrating differences. So so yeah, hopefully we'll be doing more more of that. Well, that sounds fantastic, Shannon, mm -hmm. and thanks a million for uh, such a great presentation. As you know yourself, this is right up my street. I love this type of conversation. So yes. um, loved it, and I really loved the mm -hmm. um, the discrimination between kind of the fitting in and the actual belonging yeah i think that's so important um we have a couple of questions in the chat but just mm -hmm. um i suppose one of the, mm -hmm. the things that came up first for me was like what would you say taking all that into account like would there be a message that you'd give 
to families that might have or or educate early years educators that might be at the beginning of the journey for neurodivergent children yeah um and of course you know that could be a a whole nother presentation, a whole day workshop. Uh, I, I suppose what I, you know, the first thing that I'd want to say is the sooner that parents, educators, circle of support can adopt an affirming mindset, um, the more helpful it will be. So these messages can start day one by valuing, valuing all um, communication attempts and appreciating special interests and autistic play um you again you, you might be familiar I, that that is a, a term that is used frequently within the autistic community is just that kind of autistic play and recognizing that uh, quite often it looks different but again remember that play is is recreation you know play is individual again reinforcers are individually determined um and the whole idea behind play is that it's it's kind of if you want to call it, automatic reinforce it, it's naturally reinforcing um and so you know that's what's reinforcing to kids sometimes is lining up toys or you know dropping them repetitively or whatever it is um so yeah I, and i think historically we've we've wanted to get in there no 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 don't do that you know instead do this um and 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 again i i think yes we can expose them to different ways of of engaging with things but i don't think a i don't think that's where we start um and b yeah it's just i think we're, we're going to be much more effective at building relationships um well-being and supporting youth um and uh, yeah supporting their overall development when we are um valuing valuing th th their differences but you know their preferences their ways of engaging um and and that kind of thing so so yeah i mean a lot of it is just as i said kind of mindset you know shifting our perspective um and then to be honest there are there are certainly some practices some early intervention practices that are more aligned with neuroaffirmative practices um and those would be kind of the naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions uh so like e esdm early start denver model would be one and um, there's project impact jasper there's there's a bunch of stuff um they inherently teach in natural environments through children's interests um and they're more developmentally um well they take into account um, developmental practices and that kind of thing. So, you know, yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's a good place to start. There's there's still obviously a, a fair number of criticisms, if you want to put it that way, um, about those. Again, still kind of a, an emphasis on it, compliance, which I don't think really needs to be there. I, I think you can build assent into that. Um, and as well, kind of normalization, kind of move in. So, so again, I, I think it's back to just making it socially valid. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff. Uh, looking at the, the 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 behaviors. Actually, I don't know if I'm going on too much about this, but um, yeah, I mean, it just in terms of looking at the value, one one of the the examples m might be like gestures. Look, some people some people use gestures, some people don't, and like by and large, most of us can get by without using gestures so like do you, does that really really need to be a huge emphasis um it, it is a big piece in a lot of the kind of the ndbis and stuff like that but like on the other hand you know there are possibly some gestures that really do serve an important function for you know if, if a child's saying juice 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 and they don't have the the words to you know say the orange juice or the blackberry or you know to be able to kind of point or indicate gesturally in some way um so yeah, again, it, it's all down to context and like just asking the question. Is this and, gonna, yeah, is this going to yeah. start? Like, what are we trying to teach and why? Does like, is there actually a reason? A reason for this? Yeah, not Perfect. just because it, it 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 sits in a curriculum on a book. And then just I suppose to build on that a little bit, then um, when we're saying uh, talking about the early years, 
like what would be your advice in terms of like kind of adolescents or people that might be late to diagnosis in terms of embracing their differences and um fitting in and and ones that may have internalized masking yeah so again a very complex um question and and, and that's why I, I i love that that you guys are hosting this and that we're having these conversations because uh i think part of it is just that in having these conversations in the open increasing um everyone's awareness to differences um so so that is you know one piece of it so making sure that that is embedded in the cultures of schools and you know that we're talking about differences they're they're actually um I'm gonna admit I don't I don't know much about it. There's there's a, a program in the UK, Leans, um, that is sitting on my desktop and just haven't had the time. That's the time to look at it. But um, I, I mean I've heard good things about it, uh, and, and that's what they're you know the, obviously what they're trying to do is is like just yeah increase awareness of, of neurodivergence in in schools and the broader community. So so you know it's it's some of that. But I still do think as well um, that we, you know, if we, you know, as parents or, or educators or whatever, genuinely um, making a point to try to create opportunities um, for neurodivergent folks to, to connect and encouraging them to do so. Um, look, you know, I, I said social connection is really important. And, I mean, even the research shows us that it's um, like it's it's easier with people that we relate to. So, so for example, um, you know, there's research um, that suggested that you know neurotypical peers rate autistic peers as awkward and less desirable to spend time with. Um, on the other hand, you know, there's another study: autistic people rated autistic peers. So again, same group more favorably when they displayed social communication characteristics that were considered atypical. So again, you know. It's an area I, that needs further exploration really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and again, I'm not, I'm not talking, I, I'm afraid this is coming across as like segregation, I think. It, it's it's not, um, but, and and I, I think though that many people just, Look, my, my son, my son is kind of friends with everyone, if you want to put it that way. He does under at this point, he does understand the under the, the concept of friends. But he is definitely like all of his his close friends are neurodivergent, you know, like all of his interests. So I think um I think seeking out opportunities, uh, encourage them to seek out opportunities to engage with people uh, with similar interests, you know, so making sure that again like if you're doing buddy groups it's it's not just oh you know again as i said oh that yeah oh that's that's he's such a kind and gentle kid what well, let, let's pair him up with 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 him or do, do you know what i'm saying it, it's yeah. it's valuing those interests um and then that goes back to the the kind of belonging rather than just fitting in again so yeah that's what it, yeah, yeah exactly that's exactly what it is if i find helping them find where they belong and a lot of times that might be that you have to strategic like you have to create there's that like you know a group in the community like the neurodivergent group that we're trying to, to create maybe something like that in the school or just even my son, my son's group was that like he's Dungeons and Dragons, like <laughs> pretty much all his group is the the Wednesday Dungeons and da Dragons group. So, like facilitating those opportunities um, and encouraging, like sometimes yes, it might take some encouraging, you know, some some prompting and some some reinforcement. But I think when they get into those environments, if they've been of a mindset where, you know, I need to fit in, um, you know, I've been masking all my life. Um, again, when they get into those environments where they can just be, I think things will just fall into place themselves. Yeah. Uh, and again, it is because it's it's just natural communities of reinforcement. Yeah. Um, does that Shannon, I just want to, before we finish up, because we're just running out of time here, I just right. want to acknowledge a couple of questions that are in the chat there. So the first one there is just, um, 
what we want to know if the Brenny Brown is the one who wrote Atlas of the Heart. Do you know that? Probably. <laughs> I, I have to say I'm more familiar with like her podcast and the TED Talks than okay. I am the actual. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> we can, the we next can one here is um, thank you so much for sharing your own experience. Can you comment on being believed? as this fundamentally undermines credibility of ND folks and sometimes parents, educators, etc., can be too quick to dismiss individual experience. Okay. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? Is that in the Q&A? Yes. Okay. Because as part of my style, I suppose, I, I actually do process text better. Um, particularly when um i'm anxious like this um, i challenge just to give you a heads up there that that we're at time now like so okay. just, yeah perfect. is it i i tell you what like i am very very happy to answer questions and in, in, in fairness as i say you're probably going to get a better response in email anyway because i am i'm, I'm much better in written form um so I, I'm happy. I'm happy for you guys to to reach out. Well, if you uh, want, oh. if you want to take a minute to a minute or two to um, answer that question, that's fine, Shannon. And then we'll. Oh, I, I'm, I'm I'm okay. Sorry, I thought we were moving on. I I haven't even found it. Uh, do 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 do. Hold on. So it was questions, questions. Oh, and I didn't even get to see the poll. How, how many people were were familiar with neurodiversity? What was everybody pretty or most people? Okay. So um, comment on being believed as a, this fundamentally undermines credibility of any, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I think you're right. You're absolutely right. And no, like, I, I don't have, um, I don't have a good answer to that. I think that's why we're, I suppose, a lot of us are trying to like spread the word um increase compassion um you know talk about you know soft skills within the field um yes we need data absolutely we need evidence um and we need to listen to real people we do uh yeah and, and 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 look there there are ways of accumulating data and evidence through kind of testimonials and stuff like that um as behavior analysts we probably tend to do less of that but yeah it it, it, it is tough it is tough um and 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 similarly like when i think back to look i think i landed in this field originally in part because I, it gave me a way of categorizing, conceptual accounting, quantifying. Every, like it gave me a way of making sense of things, and and it's easy to rely on that. It's harder to look beyond that. I think. Um. So, yeah, I, I think we just keep trying. <laughs> I don't, I don't know great. if that's useful at all. Yeah. No, oh, that's great, Shannon. And look, like Shannon said, if anybody has any questions after that, they can contact her at um, reach 